Welcome to another evening of Frank Conversation here on Hard Copy, coming to you from our studios in Abuja. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. On Wednesday, September the 15th, nearly a week after the president visited the southeast state of Imo on a one-day working visit, members of the Southeast Caucus in both chambers of the National Assembly met and produced a communique. Top amongst the issues raised in their communique is the sit-at-home order given by IPOP and the attendant socio-economic aftershocks, the declining state of security in the Southeast, and the continued feeling of marginalization amongst Southeasterners. Was this a direct response to the President's visit and his entreaty for peace and unity? What will it take to restore lasting peace to the Southeast? These are some of the issues I take on with my guest tonight, Senator Ike Ikwerimadu, a three-time Deputy Senate President and current Chairman of the Senate Committee on Environment. Senator Ikwerimadu, welcome to Hard Copy. My pleasure. The situation in the Southeast between February and April this year was worrisome for both Southeasterners in particular and Nigerians in general. The onslaught of attacks on government-owned facilities was something to worry about. But the caucus didn't say much at the time. Was there a reason for this? No, not exactly. But you know, we have levels of leadership everywhere, including Iboland. We have the Hanese. We also have uh, the Governor's Forum. And they have church leaders as well. So uh, we expected them to take the responsibility of not just speaking out, but trying to douse those tensions. Well, of course, they tried, you know, within the limits, you know, of expectations and their powers. So, but unfortunately, we viewed with um, uh, regrets that people didn't hit to some of their calls for um, restraint, including the federal government and indeed uh, some of our people. So, um, it got a point where it appears that um, things were getting very, very bad. And so, it appears that nobody was listening to each other. So, we felt as a representative of the people, it is time for us to also try uh, and intervening you know, take it from where our other leaders stopped. The timing of your meeting mm -hmm. and your communique was quite strategic. A week, exactly a week after the president visited the Southeast. Was it deliberate? Well, there was a conversation between our people, especially the Hanese and the president. Personally, some of us were not there. I was not there because the meeting took place the same day we had our National Executive Committee meeting on the PDP. So most of the PDP leaders were in Abuja. You know, so most of us were not there. So I'm not sure what was uh, agreed, you know, but it absolutely has nothing to do with uh, the uh, meeting at all. Would you have been there, assuming you didn't have the PDP meeting? Well, the Hannes invited me to that meeting. So I would have been happy to be there. You know, anything that concerns our people concerns me as well. But because we have a commitment to the party meeting we had uh, that same day, and because other leaders will be there, so because they can speak for all of us. So we decided, some of us in PDP, to attend the National Executive Committee and allow those uh, our colleagues, our friends and our brothers in APC and Ohanese and some church leaders to go and represent us. The wordings of your um, communique were quite instructive. I'd like to read out a particular paragraph. You say you express solidarity with our people in the Southeast over the marginalization of the region in the scheme of things within the Nigerian Commonwealth. The caucus feels the pains of our people and their quest for equity, justice, and protection of their lives and property in every part of the country. So the caucus therefore resolved to continue to fight for a level playing ground and an enabling federal system where Indigo is, enabled to, is able to develop their homeland at their pace and equally pursue their happiness and actualize their enormous potential in every part of the country unmolested. Now, I don't know, reading through this, one would think that there is a deliberate plan by the Nigerian state to marginalize the Southeast. Is this what the Southeast, the caucus is trying to communicate, or is this just a feeling among Southeasterners? You see, the um, people of the Southeast, they are used to a communal life. To them, communal life means living together with everybody. Anywhere you go in this country, you see an Igbo man. And now, over many years, you see that there's a shift in accommodation they've had with their host communities, host cities, and all of that. So people started coming home. You know, most of our people were born in the north. They never know any other place except the north, you know, as their home. 
So we integrated every part of Nigeria. And this has been why our people, you know, feel free wherever they go and then establish their business and all of that. Now, we now have a government, you know, which we believe should be able to protect every Nigerian, no matter where you live. So this is one aspect of it. But we didn't see that because some people were chased out of their, their businesses, chased out of their homes outside the land. So they returned home. Now, as if that was not enough, we believe that the Constitution made provision for federal character in appointments. We also believe that the government is about the people and people everybody. We also believe that once the election is over, what remains is leadership. So we expected leadership from the present regime that will accommodate everybody. You know, because where there is uh, peace, there's progress. And where there's injustice, you don't respect peace. Mm. So we felt that our people had been kept out of the corridors of power over this period, especially in the security sector. Mm. So we expect that security sector, every part of Nigeria should be represented. Because if you are discussing about security of the country, there must be people who will be able to give perspective in respect of their own region or the area in the discussion. So they'll be able to take an aggregate view of all that's happening. With regards to security, every yes. part of the country has felt its own pain of insecurity Definitely, in recent yes. times. In fact, we've seen southern governors uh, profess some solutions in terms of coming up with some, they say it's not regional security, but we continue to say it's a regional security effort in mm. trying to bring peace. Mm. Uh, so when you say that southeasterners did not feel safe in mm. parts of the country, um, and even at home right now, because mm. when we talk about the security situation in the southeast, we're referring specifically to the southeast. Mm. Um, is it as a result of the agitations? Because some, some Nigerians seem to take exception to how the agitations in the southeast have now taken shape. You see, that's what I said. The fact that they left other places and returned to their homes, and yet they're not safe. As a result of what? Why did they have to leave other places? Yes, because they, they are not secure in those places. That is very, very unfortunate. You know, so the issue of insecurity all over, the, all over Nigeria is not as if it's uh, coming out of the blues. Mm -hmm. It's expected. So people like us have spoken about it for over 10 years now. And I kept saying that it's going to get worse. I do keep getting worse because we're not doing the right thing. There are those who have blamed the elite. Yes. Are those it's not the elite are, issue. No, no, no. It's the security architecture. Let me put this that in, is wrong. In, in context. Yes. There are those who have blamed the elite that these agitations of, and feelings of marginalization started with the elite because, I mean, they have felt like they were out of the corridors of power and somewhat encouraged uh, the, agita the agitators whom somehow now they cannot seem to control anymore and the manner in which those agitators have gone about their business is beginning to cause ill feelings in other parts of the country do you agree with that assessment never never you see the thing is this what we are seeing in terms of agitation is a reaction to injustice right because any man who is unjustly treated is not going to be interested in peace it's a reaction so it's not the leaders of any particular country that's of any uh, part of Nigeria that is telling the federal government to have a deliberate policy of excluding a whole region you know, from the corridors of power. No, I'm not sure there's any such conspiracy between the leaders of the Southeast and the federal government. We're talking about inclusivity. A situation where you have the army, the police, the air force, the navy, the, the, uh, the uh, immigration, prison, and all of that. And nobody from the South is considered good enough to hear any of this. I mean, it's, it's, it's an affront to the people. It affects their psychology. So I've read the delegation personally all the people on this of Nigeria, yes. they have spoken against it. Why would those same people of Nigeria now begin to, you know, make the Igbo feel unsafe in other parts of the country? No, it's not, it's not as if there's a conspiracy, you know, of the, the people of Nigeria against the Igbo. No, certainly we have a lot of friends all over the place, right? Just as we too have felt the consents the worries of other people. I've gone to the, to the Northeast to meet the people in the IDPs. And I explained to them that I was just quite young during the Civil War. I was barely four years. So I knew what I went through, and other people of my age. So I can feel their pains. So we believe as well that whatever is happening in the Southeast also affects everybody in Nigeria. So, but we wanted the federal government to make a deliberate effort to ensure that the people of the South is feel, feel wanted in Nigeria and not having policies, you know, and conducts that appear to be say we are pushing out of the, the country you belong, the country you beat with all the rest of all of us. Were the president's words assuring in that regard? Because he says he doesn't 
thing that any Igbo man would feel like he, he or she is not Nigerian. Uh, he doesn't know why anyone would feel that way. Um, and that, you know, he made reference to the integration which you talked about, the fact that anywhere you go, you will always see an Igbo person. Did you find the president's no, words and visit the, reassuring? It's what you say and what you do are two different things. I've told you, after the election in 2015, I took it upon myself to have a conversation with the president. In the presence of one of my friends, a senator from Castina uh, uh, State, right? So we met with the president. I said, look, this election has divided up more than any other election. I would like to see uh, uh, a, the president to have a conversation with the South East and South South people over how they will feel integrated in your government. And he assured me he was going to have a meeting after the inauguration, but somehow that never took place. And when this issue of the South East complaints, I took the senators from the South, I had a conversation with them. I said, look, this is where my people are complaining. We didn't make, want to make it a media issue. We felt as leaders, we can have a conversation on things that concerns us. And you don't think that that is an elite conversation, let me put it that way. Because as you talked about, they say it's one thing to say, it's another thing to do. For some people, they say that <laughs> when, they, when they assess what the president has done so far, especially in terms of infrastructural development, mm -hmm. the South East has not had it as well under any other administration, regardless of how many people were in government under those administrations. You see, it's not enough to put infrastructures and then they are not part of the decision making of the place, of the, of the, of the area, either the state or federal. So that's why we have representative government, so that every part will be there when decisions have been made. So assuming an Igbo man is president, and maybe a part of, part of you just say Southwest, let me just use that for instance, and then you have a whole side with all the, the endowments, the education, the exposure, and you don't have one single person from the Southwest, you know, you can trust, you know, or be able to believe that he can handle any of the what, sectors of the, the reason why the how people do you, how do you explain that? who point to be happy? being an elite conspiracy mm. point to it is because in the places where they have or they supposedly have representation, mm. those places, the, the human index um, in those places are really nothing to write home about. Apart from where the uh, sub-national like level like is, doing, is doing what it needs to do in those areas to bring development home to those people. Mm -hmm. We have since mentioned the security situation mm -hmm. in many parts of the country, mm -hmm. not just in the southeast of the country. We've talked about, you say you've been to yes. um, Meduguri, you've been to the northeast yes. of the country, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that you must have seen how a lot of the people live in internally displaced persons camp. Nobody's happy uh, about that. Nobody, including exactly. myself. Exactly. So if, if we were to swap it and mm -hmm. say, for the people who have representation in government, for mm. the people whose people are in government, have their people felt the impact of their people in government? That's, don't, don't you think that's a valid question to ask? No, no it's a different kettle of fish, whether they feel impact or not. I'm talking of inclusivity here, right? If you have children, and then you treat some, give preference to some of your children, and the others first feel left out, I'm sure as a father, I mean, you are not actually uh, 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 up to your responsibility you know, for parenting those people. Because you're able to take care of your children, at least in equal manners. So the issue of parenting should be comprehensive. And that's what leadership in a country is like. Okay, you liken it to parenting. But let me quickly talk about this, uh, because your caucus also say that you're going to set up a committee to intervene on this matter, which is the matter of Namdi Kanu. What results are you hoping to get from your intervention? Well, it's not uh, easy to predict right now. But what I want to see is to reduce tension in the southeast. What I want to see is to, that they make sure that um, the federal government understands the feeling of our people. What I want to see is for our young people to believe that their leaders are making a case for them at the highest level. You know, so but we expect that ultimately we'll find a way, a political solution, you know, in respect of the uh, Namikano's uh, problem. But I don't want to predict what will happen. But in the past, we've done the similar thing. When Uwazirike was detained by Obasanjo, he was in detention until Yadira came. I led a delegation of my colleagues in the Senate. I had a conversation with the President, invited and his Attorney General. Eventually, we ended up in a political solution and Uwazirike was uh, released. Same thing with thinking that the can. When he was detained, I also led a delegation to meet with the President. So we expect that just as we had some results in the past, including the release of Namdi and uh, Wazrike, maybe we should come up with something, 
you know, that should be acceptable uh, to all the parties. Welcome back. You're watching Hard Copy coming to you from our studios in Abuja. Our guest tonight is Senator Ike Ikuramadu, a three-time Deputy Senate President and current Chairman of the Senate Committee on Environment. On the sit-at-home order, it would seem that there was initial reluctance by government leaders in the Southeast to speak up on the matter. But in recent times, they have spoken up quite loudly. The question is whether the people are listening. Why do you think that there seems to be a, a reluctance on the part of the people to listen to their leaders with respect to this sit-at-home order? Let me tell you, there's, there's a, there is a break in communication between the people and the leaders. So that's the important thing to note here. So because of that, there's also a fear sector. You know, fear uh, 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 um, factor, rather. So because some people who are eager to come out cannot come out because they are not sure that government and security agents will, will protect them. So they just have to keep stay at home. And remember, in the Southeast, their major occupation is commerce. So they live on daily bread. They go out and fend for themselves. So if you don't go to work on Saturday, you don't go to work on Sunday because you've gone to church, and on Monday again, you can't go out. So we believe that that is not good for our people. That destroys an economy. That kills people. It breeds hunger and it entrenches poverty. So we now said, look, we can't continue in this way. So we need to appeal to our young people to reason with us, to be able to call off these things. Yeah, good enough, the IPOP that started, they said, no, we have, no more have anything to do with it. That these are sheer criminals who are now trying to take advantage of what we wanted to do earlier. The first. So what we're going to do now is to ensure that Mondays and other such days, our people will come out and do their business. The first thing you said was that there was a break in communication between the leader and the led. Yes. Would you also say it is a crisis of legitimacy amongst leaders? I don't think it has to do legitimacy. And IPOP leaders? No, I don't think it's issue of legitimacy. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of uh, difference you know, in uh, approach. Right? So the leaders rightly had believed that if there is anything going wrong, if there is issue of marginalization and injustice, we can talk about it. We don't continue to push it. We don't want any kind of violence. Because anybody that's scared in the circumstance will not rise again. So, so everybody believes there's an injustice. But it's a matter of approach. How do we resolve it? Do we continue a conversation? Or do we become violence? But the deep problem with the violence is that the violence is visited on us, our own people. So either our people visiting the, 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 the violence or the federal agencies are visiting the, problem, the violence in reaction to what our young people are doing. Whichever way you look at it, we are losing. Are you going to meet the president over this? We hope to meet him at some point, yeah, definitely. I've told we've met with him several in the past over matters such as this. I'm sure he'll be happy to meet with us. Your meeting is coming even as uh, southern governors are also meeting as well, and they have also proposed their own, they come out with a communique, they are mm -hmm. saying that uh, they want the presidency to come to the south the southern parts of the country, and this mm. is the second time they're mm. saying it. Mm. Um, it would seem that they had to re-emphasize this particular point. Mm. I mean, the fact that they're still saying that you should come to the south, mm. they haven't said what region it, it should go to. Mm. But do you think, do you support the stance of the southern governors? These are our leaders. we we'll stand by them. That's okay for us. But remember that PDP has set up a zoning committee. So it will be prejudicial if we take a firm position on this matter as a party. Yes, they are talking as governors across party lines, which is good. But for us as a PDP, we would like to have a conversation on this subject. And that's why we set up a committee headed by my own governor, uh, right when we find you We believe that they'll do the right thing. Incidentally, the meeting held in your state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't think that it already puts him in a bind? I don't think so. My governor is not somebody who can put that kind of bind. No, he's not going to. Uh, I think he's, no, he's a very reasonable person. You know, so he's going to consult widely. He's not the only person in the committee anyway. He's not the only person yeah, so, in the committee. Mm -hmm. He's not the only southern governor in the PDP there as well. Of course, yes. Uh, the, uh, the PDP southern governors, are they not aware of what is happening within their party to say, you know what, southern governors, perhaps you should hold on on this uh, for now? No, no, no. They are just reiterating what they said earlier. So it's nothing new. Indeed. They just say we still stand uh, on the issue of a certain president. 
considering the developments in your party, because this, this talk mm -hmm. around a, you know, a, the possibility of it going back to the north mm -hmm. has come mostly from your party. Mm -hmm. um, don't you think that some, the southern governor should have re expressed some reservations about that, considering the new developments that have come up in your I party? I don't believe the PDP are taking any such decision. No, they they, if they have, they will set up a committee. But I've said that as a person, I stand with where our leaders will stand. Are there any parts in your community which you think that you're going to be taking up in the National Assembly, especially, especially since you're a National Assembly caucus, um, and especially now that the National Assembly has just come back from recess? Well, I think this is essentially our internal problem, which is security, well, in terms of security, uh, uh, um, I guess the security of the large and property in our area. The, other, the, the area that's related to it is the issue of policing which have personally sponsored a bill that's been considered at the level of the, uh, um, the Constitutional Amendment Committee, right? So, which is by my successor. So, so we're going to continue to push that because that's the only thing that can guarantee the safety of lives and property in Nigeria. You saw attempts in recent times. Yes. I mean, we saw attempts by South East, South South, uh, even South Southwest governors in particular mm. uh, to come up with what they said were state was state policing outfits. Well, not state police in that sense, but some security outfits. We mm. saw Moteko, we saw attempts at Ibubiago. In the Southeast in particular, it hasn't quite worked. Ibubiago hasn't taken off mm. as it ought to. Why do you think that's the reason? You uh, see, those are just panic measures. It's not enduring. And at worst, it's going to be a court anarchy. Right? This is not because of ESN. No, I'm not talking about ESN. I'm no, just... no, I'm saying Ibubayago didn't get off because they were going to have a clash with ESN. I don't know. It's the governors will answer that one. Because they are, we agreed at the of Southeast that the bag should set, be set up. So if there's a delay, I'm not in the position to, to explain why that happened. It was part of the draft of the legal uh, document. Let's, let's say for it. So whether why it's not in place today, I'm not in the position to answer. You know, because it's left for the various state government. But I believe... It doesn't mean that you're I not believe, in a position to know. You're just I'm not in a position to answer. No, 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 no. I'm not in a position to know. Because some of the state government, they have some um, organizations or, if you like, institutions they consider to be uh, uh, secret outfits. Not necessarily a bubago. Some have forest guard and all of that. You know, but I think there was an agreement they reached to set up a uniform security uh, uh, network, they call it bag. But until now, that has not happened. So I'm not sure um, what the reason might be, but I believe that every state is taking their own peculiar uh, uh, um, steps to guide and secure its own uh, uh, territory. I ask this because we do know that in the E or on the in the wake of setting up Ibubiago, I mean, for the states who did try, mm. uh, there were reported clashes. Eboin, for instance, reported mm. some clashes uh, between members of the Ibubiago and um, the Eastern Security Network. And there were fears that, you know, that was going to create a crisis of some sort. Uh, one of legitimacy and one, and the second, wh whether the people were going to, which one the people were going to follow. Mm. If both of them were being established for the security mm of uh, lives of the people of the southeast you see you see that's the point i'm making that those panic measures can only lead to anarchy because our solution to our security challenge in nigeria is to have a constitutionally constitutional provision for a decentralized policing right to have sub-national police the difference between that and what they are doing is that there will be a law a constitutional provision that will not only make provision for the establishment of those subnational policing at the state and probably at the local government, but it is also going to make provision for how they are regulated. Right? That's what is missing in what the states are doing. They may have their own internal regulation, but that is not enough. So unless we do that, we are going to continue to have this kind of clash. The problem we have right now is that not a lot more non-state actors are yes. carrying weapons about. Yes, because we don't want to do the right thing. So if you have legitimate use of force provided for in the Constitution, and you have it in place in 36 states, assuming you have, say, 500 police, policemen, 
or no, just say uh, 5,000 policemen or whatever in state fighting uh, insecurity there in very the different is going to overwhelm all the bandits, right? Well, because the federal police are insufficient, ill trained, you know, and they're ill compensated, sometimes they are discouraged. When they die, nobody cares. Mm. So, but if a state sets up their own legitimate and constitutionally provided security outfit, it means that a war against bandits and all of this will be fought in 36 states. We've but it is not happening because with the number of soldiers and police we have are limited. So, if you just scatter all over the country, the, the, the bandits will overwhelm them. Senator Ike Kuramadu, yeah. thank you for coming on My Hard pleasure. Copy. Mm -hmm. Well, that's our program tonight. Your mail and feedback are welcome to the handle showing on your screen. Thank you for watching. I'm Maupel Gwen Yusuf. Good night.